destined for How it ends It's the fall So greetings to all the Physio TV viewers. So as we delve, we just had Dr. Vadit talking about uh, the surgeon's perspective about how to manage a carpal tunnel syndrome. Now we look at the physiotherapy aspect from Dr. Bhakti Khandedia. Dr. Bhakti Khandedia is, has done a bachelor's in physiotherapy from Lokmanya Tilak Municipal Medical College, Sain, Mumbai. And she's a very proud alumni. She's done her master's from Sancheri Institute, College of Physiotherapy, and has specialized in musculoskeletal physiotherapy. She's currently working as a hand physiotherapist in Sanjeti Hospital, Sanjeti Institute of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation in Pune and specializes in hand injuries and rehab, conservative as well as post-surgical management. So with a keen interest in hand and she's developing a hand unit very, I mean, I would say she's taking it places and developing it very well. So I, without wasting much time, I pass on the session to Ms. Bhakti, Dr. Bhakti. Yeah, over to you. Thank you for kind introduction, ma'am. Uh, so I'll be starting with the seminar now. Uh, so the topic of today's this thing is uh, preservative and post-operative management of carpal tunnel syndrome. So just sir has uh, given us the idea about how the carpal tunnel syndrome presents. What are the uh, surgicals and uh, how do we reach to the clinical diagnosis and what are the conservative approaches and surgical approaches to the carpal tunnel? So I'll be looking about, so today in this topic, I'll be talking about presentations of carpal tunnel syndrome. What are the normal and abnormal carpal tunnel pressures and the factors that influence it? There are intrinsic and extrinsic factors to it. Uh, what are the differential diagnosis and associated conditions along with uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, what are the conservative management uh, what what are the dosage what are the recent advances are available to prove that the conservative management is uh, effective for carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, decisions for arthritic fabrication and post operative management so usually the presentation of carpal tunnel syndrome is like the patient present with the paresthesia along the median nerve distribution there is a loss of dexterity and Manipulation of small objects, there is night pain, tingling along the median nerve, uh, and uh, which is usually relieved by shaking and stretching the hands. Uh, depending upon the severity, the carpal tunnel syndrome is again divided into acute type, uh, chronic onset, recurrence, dynamic, mild, moderate, and severe. So, in a dynamic type of carpal tunnel syndrome, it only presents with the symptoms when uh, the 
the when when the person is this uh, when the person is doing some dynamic activities when the person is doing some repetitive actions or when the person is loading the hand into certain position only then the symptoms are presented uh, in a mild type of carpet tunnel syndrome the symptoms are occasionally present the tunnel stress and the balance stress is present but there is no sensory loss or a motor loss in moderate the symptoms are more intermittent uh, there is some sensory loss in it and uh, in severe kind there is a marked atrophy present. So we look into the clinical tests that are present for the carpal tunnel syndrome. So I will just quickly brush through it. There is carpal compression test also called as Durkheim sign uh, in which we press the carpal canal uh, uh, polarly over the carpal and see for the reproduction of symptoms. There is a balance test in which you do the flexion of the wrist, extreme flexion of wrist and hold the position for 60 seconds and then you see if the symptoms are reproducing or not. Uh, Tina's test is the tapping along the root of the, tapping along the length of nerve and uh, lumbrical incursion or Burgers test is something uh, you have to hold the wrist in neutral position and make a fist, sustain a fist position for 30 seconds. And if the symptoms are reproducing, then the lumbar lumbrical incursion test is positive. Uh, Signal's Western monofilament test is for sensory assessment and EMG and CV studies are the diagnostics test for uh, this carpal tunnel syndrome. So before going ahead to the carpal tunnel syndrome, I would like to brief you all about what is carpal tunnel pressure. So basically carpal tunnel is formed by the roof of carpal bones. Uh, it is formed by the pillars of hook of amet and the pisiform bone and the roof is formed by the flexor retinal pillum under width underneath which there lies a nine flexor tendons and a median nerve. Okay, so there is a diameter of the carpal tunnel. There is a, some pressure line inside the canal. So in the normal individuals, at rest, the carpal tunnel pressure has measured to be around 10 millimeter of mercury. And when, act, when you are doing some activity, the pressure in the carpal canal ranges from 30 to 50 millimeter of mercury. But when there is inflammation, when there is swelling, when there are the carpal tunnel compression is present due to whatever reason, whatever uh, at uh, whatever structures are giving the pressure so that time the carpal tunnel pressure raises up to 1000 millimeter of mercury so you can imagine the amount of pressure that develops in the carpal tunnel syndrome so there are factors which adds to this pressure there are intrinsic factors and the extrinsic factors so the intrinsic factors are uh, any condition which adds to the inflammation and swelling edema around the wrist like a fracture or trauma can give you the signs of carpal tunnel compression. Okay. Uh, like uh, even when there is a acute dislocation of the intercarpal or the carpal bones, the or there is a fracture fragment underlying the carpal canal, then the symptoms are present. Tumor or any space occupying lesion can give the symptoms. Sinovitis, any inflammatory or rheumatological conditions. Uh, which are uh, they are in the distal extremities. Mm, carpal arthritis, if the carpal the floor is collapsed, then again the symptoms might be present. Anomalous subretinacular muscle and tendon attachment. So there can be adventitious muscle or tendon present or the vascular structure present along with the other structures and may be the reason for adding to the compression. Uh, high weight and BMI has been reported in the studies that uh, as that increases more of carpal tunnel pressure. Um, even with high weight and BMI, there is a reduction in the uh, cross-sectional area of the carpal canal and that also adds to the more compression and more pressure on the medium now. Again, coming to lumbrical incursion. So this is very interesting topic. Uh, so the lumbrical muscles uh, originates from the tendon of flexor pollicis, uh, FDP tendon, flexor digitorum profundus tendon. So whenever we are making a fist, the flexor digitorum profundus tendon slides proximally into the canal, which along which with the lumbrical muscle bellies also slides into the canal, adding to the canal content and the pressure into the canal. 
So, lambrical incursion is something very important from physiotherapy point of view, from mechanical point of view, to understand how the canal pressures and the canal uh, space is reduced with the lumbarical incursion. Coming on to the extrinsic factors, in extrinsic factors, there are work related, so whatever posture in which uh, there is a sustained wrist flexion with fist or extremes of wrist extension is causing the compression of the median nerve. Repetitive actions in the ulnar deviation also adds to the uh, compression on the canal and uh, sustained load, sustained heavy load, even 1 kg of load held for more duration of time has been documented that the canal pressure increases tremendously. And the external load, if you place the load over a thinar or hypothenar or the flexor retinaculum, it also adds to lots of uh, compression and lots of incre increases lots of canal pressure. Again, difference, going on to the differential diagnosis and associated conditions, here we know that uh, carpet tunnel syndrome is not just localized to the wrist and uh, distal to the wrist. It, we need to look into the nerve compression along the length of the nerve. We need to look into the kinetic chain. We need to look into the neural chain. And uh, then we need to decide uh, what all factors are compressing the and pushing the tension on the nerve. We need to see what is the irritability level and what is the tissue tolerance level at this stage. So, right, right, starting from the cervical, there can be dorsal root ganglion com uh, getting compressed because of cervical radiculopathy or a cervical cause. There can be scalene muscle giving the symptoms along the median now, the cervical rib or the first rib, and a vascular structures. Uh, coming to the elbow joint, there is a bicipital aponeurosis called as a uh, lacertus fibrosis. So, the fibrous structure along the uh, uh, extension at the bicipital aponeurosis can give the compression at the biceps underneath which the median nerve gets or anterior interosseous nerve gets compressed. Uh, pronator teres muscle, brachialis muscle, flexor digital of superficial muscles, uh, ligament of struthers. This is the additional ligament lying over the medial aspect of elbow, accessory head of flexor pollicis longus tendon. So all this muscle can also give rise to the symptoms along the median now. So we need to decompress all this now. We need to release the triggers along them and then we need to see if the now is getting decompressed or if the symptoms are still present. Coming at the wrist, there are the flexor retinaculum, proximal and distal carpal row. Along with this, we have also seen that uh, the median now is also positive in the cases where the flexor tenosynovitis is present. So we need to really differentiate if it is truly flexor tenosynovitis giving rise to the carpet tunnel syndrome or it is only purely carpet tunnel syndrome because the test for both the conditions have been uh, sensitive for both the conditions. Uh, then there are other conditions like bowlers, thumb, wrist vibration, hand vibration syndromes and all these things are also present in association with uh, carpet tunnel syndrome and uh, along with this there are various rheumatological conditions, pregnancy, uh, neurological uh, like systemic neuropathic diseases like uh, diabetic neuropathy, hyperthyroidism, alcoholic neuropathy, we all need to rule out those things. Coming on to the conservative management now, once we know what all structures are involved and uh, we know the diagnosis, we have already assessed and we have reached to the diagnosis, then we can start with the conservative management uh, of carpal tunnel syndrome. So uh, the systematic review has, uh, has shown that uh, the conservative management of the carpal tunnel syndrome or the physiotherapeutic management includes Positioning with orthosis, myofascial release techniques, manual therapy techniques, workplace adjustments, posture correction and weight loss and no strengthening in uh, strengthening is not advisable in conservative management of carpal tunnel syndrome. We will see why so in the further topic uh, but strengthening is not advisable. Coming on to the workplace adjustment right now, uh, any workplace which requires repetitive action, sustained loading in wrist flexion and fisting, uh, sustained extension or uh, forceful grip should be avoided 
and the adjustment in the work should be done so that you are not compressing or adding on to the pressure along the carpet tunnel. Posture correction as we see previously, as we have seen previously that the scalene muscle, the muscles along the common flexor origin in, at the elbow, all these muscles are also the cause for median nerve uh, compression distally. They also give the signs of median nerve compression. So we also need to correct the posture and balance out the muscle imbalances that are existing. Weight loss program also needs to be targeted as high BMI has been reported to give more of uh, more carpet tunnel. Like the, the prevalence of carpet tunnel syndrome among obese population is there. So we should also address to the aerobic program for weight loss. Coming on to the neural mobilization. So the, the studies suggest that uh, you need to balance whether uh, with the neural mobilization, if you are giving a strain to entrap muscle or whether the local tissue nu nutrition is improved. So depending upon uh, the patient's response, depending upon the tissue irritability, you need to decide which, which type of neural mobilization and at what stage in the rehab you, you should start neural mobilization. Uh, if the patient is overt or covert type uh, upon assessment, then you should really think whether neural mobilization will help or not. Uh, to start with, we can start with the protective remote sequence. If the, sequ if the wrist is something where the irritability of nerve is really very high, then we should consider mobilizing nerve along the shoulder or along the elbow. Then we can process proceed further with the sliders, tensioners, and then lastly, focused local sequence where the wrist mobilization or the nerve mobilization at the wrist level will come into play. So... This uh, recent advances, uh, the, there is a RCT which has proven that two end slider mobilization technique of upper limb tension test one of Shacklock type has uh, shown to be very effective. The level of evidence is 1B uh, in which uh, they have given 30 sets, uh, 30 repetitions and four sets of uh, neural mobilization in which they have given elbow extension with simultaneous wrist flexion and simultaneous uh, wrist extension with elbow flexion for uh, 30 reps and then uh, they have seen uh, they have done this study for four weeks and they have found that uh, the pain the vast and the grip strength has improved at the end of a study at the end of eight weeks so they have given the progression that uh, how you should progress along the progress for the sliders so you can see in the first position the stress position is uh, in this uh, the starting position for the, uh, the wrist is relaxed and the neck is extended and uh, the least least vigorous is where the wrist is extended and the neck is rotated instead of bending away from so you are relaxing the nerve at the neck and extending it at the wrist whereas here you are the nerve is relaxed at the wrist level and stretched at the uh, neck cervical level so you can depending upon the severity so if you want less severe you should avoid more of shoulder abduction if you want more severe you can add elbow uh, shoulder abduction component to it so depending on the vigorousity tissue irritability you should decide what uh, which type of neural mobilization and about at what level at what joint you want to stretch the nerve and how do you want to slide it along the course uh, the author has also document or the author has also suggested to go ahead for a cervical decompression first so contralateral cervical glides is advised uh, extension cervical cranial extension to improve the uh, the decompression along the root shoulder glides to decompress the nerve along the shoulder and then go ahead with the slide to sliders to see more effects these are the techniques for progression of uh, tensioners so here now when the symptoms of the slider when the symptoms improves after two weeks of sliding then we can process to the tensioning techniques and here the so progression is explained. So from start to end, you can see the less vigorous. The least vigorous being the last uh, shown in the last picture. And you can just 
choose the combination in which your pa patient fits in. The, you are getting the best possible results. Coming on to the extracorporeal shockwave therapy. So two phases of extracorporeal shockwave therapy is basically a mechanical uh, pulse, high, uh, high frequency mechanical pulse uh, treatment in which the, there are two phases. One is rapid rise of 10, na 10 nanoseconds, nanosecond focus pressure for 50 to 80 mega, uh, mega pascals followed by relatively slow phase of milliseconds duration of negative pressure that is of 10 mega pascals. So it, it causes acoustic cavitation and uh, the there are the level of evidence for extracorporeal shockwave therapy is 1 and 2B. So it is really a promising modality to see whether uh, the patients falling into the carpal canal, very acute patients can get the benefit from extracorporeal shockwave therapy. So in this, uh, they have the, the, the systematic review that I have quoted down. They have done, they have actually gathered the RCT, six RCTs and found out that a uh, majority of RCTs have used 1000 to 3000 or 5000 pulse per second of the extracorporeal shock wave. And uh, uh, they have found out results in pain, grip strength. And, but they have not found out any changes in the now conduction tests. So we need to do further uh, depend. Uh, also, there was lots of heterogeneity in uh, uh, frequency, duration and uh, dosage of uh, application of extracorporeal shockwave therapy. So we need to have more references before relying on it. Uh, low level laser therapy has also been shown to be effective. So, uh, especially when there is a pillar pain, pillar pain that is post-surgical, we will look into it further detail. So, the wavelength of 8, 30 nanometer with a power of 30 milliwatts and energy deliverance of 3 joule for 5 consecutive days have been shown to be effective in cases of uh, mild to moderate uh, carpal tunnel syndromes. And uh, uh, they have found relief in, again, uh, this they have found uh, better uh, better findings so they have found that uh, pain is improved but again uh, they have not seen any differences in nerve conduction test or uh, uh, latency uh, going on to the ultrasound and phonophoresis uh, as it is are present, which are showing that the continuous and pulse mode of ultrasound therapy for 1 megahertz frequency with a 1.0 watts per centimeter square intensity for 10 minutes per session for 4 weeks. Uh, though they, they have given 10 sessions along 4 weeks and they have found that uh, actually they have compared uh, two types of phonophoresis and ultrasound. So they have compared dexamethasone sodium phosphate gel with ultrasound pyroxicam with ultrasound and pure ultrasound and they have found that uh, the pain has the VAS, the visual analog scale has significantly improved over 10 sessions for all the uh, components for all the uh, in all the uh, groups you know in all the groups after the this thing but uh, again, they have not found any of to be treatment superior to any other. Like ultrasound was not superior than phonophoresis. Both were equally effective. And the level of evidence is low to moderate. Uh, again, to compare, there is a RCT which compared ultrasound with laser and ultrasound has proven to be more effective in that case. These are the kinesio tape. So kinesio tape has actually helped in only short period of time. It helps to reduce pain and feeling of sensations of numbness and paresthesia along the nerve. So it just gives the, uh, decompresses the flexor retinaculum over the canal and gives the gentle stretch on the, along the length of median now. Coming on to the yoga, this is really very good study, but old one. Here, uh, the author has studied, uh, author has taken a 42 samples in which all the samples were geriatric population uh, the 20 were given the just printing uh, so the inclusion criteria for the study was uh, 
only uh, the older patients with carpal tunnel syndrome more than four weeks of onset uh, and uh, they have given eight sessions uh, eight weekly treatments for yoga like they are given twice a week session for eight weeks of yoga therapy to one group and other group was given only splint and they have found out that uh, the tenor stress is reduced balance stress is reduced pain is reduced grip strength is improved and uh, but there was no difference in sleep disturbances and uh, functional outcomes in the uh, yoga group but uh, we can uh, they have also given um, to the yoga group they have given 11 postures like uh, dandasan parvatasan seated eagle poses you can see in the pictures hasta uttanasan ardha mukha shavasana in all these poses there is a extension occurring at the wrist um, so, which can help to relieve the pressure along the median now. Also, these all stretches are targeting whole of the cervical, whole of the upper limb posture and giving the stretches to all the muscles along the upper limb. So, uh, this really seems to be a promising study for the future and for patients also. Again, coming on to the decision for orthosis fabrication. So, carpal tunnel pressure was leased with the wrist in a neutral position with a, uh, with a degree of extension to 9 degrees and to uh, 3 degrees to ulnar deviation. That is almost a neutral wrist. They have found out to be the best possible least pressure for the car carpal canal. Uh, again, coming on to the uh, so, the orthosis fabrication should be such that the wrist is in neutral position and not in ulnar deviation, flexion or extension. Again, the palmar is longest tendon. If it is loaded, it pulls the flexor retinaculum via the insertion of palmar aponeurosis. So, any tension along the palmar aponeurosis should be reduced while, while making the uh, orthosis fabrication. Uh, effects of finger positioning. So, all those uh, anxious patients or the patients who have repetitive gripping work or those who have hypertrophied uh, this muscles, uh, hypothenar and thenar muscles are tend to have more uh, or those who have tendency to do more of finger flexion, we should consider giving them block at the metacarpophalangeal joint into slight ex extension of 20 to 40 degrees because Again, we just saw the lumbrical excursion taking place and causing more, adding on to the can canal compression. So, we should avoid a uh, full fist. So, any activity which involves full fisting. So, uh, fisting more than 50 degrees. That by, so, there is already the lumbricals into the canal by 1.5 millimeters. So, you can imagine more the more amount of flexion at the finger is taking place, the more lumbricals are pulled into uh, the canal and more compression on the median nerve is taking place. And hence, no strengthening is advisable at the early stage uh, or uh, uh, for conservative management of carpal tunnel. And you should consider blocking MCP into slight flex, uh, 20 to 40 degrees of flexion because you don't want lumbrical to uh, move proximally into the canal and cause canal compression. So, again, you should consider uh, adding whether to add or not. Again, if there is concomitant uh, flexor tenosynovitis at the wrist and giving the pain, then we can just add a block at the metacarpal and allow the patient to do hook fist. So, that will allow, we allow us to do tendon gliding exercise and hence even the tendon symptoms will be relieved further. So, this should be really considered when the tendons are in flex when the patient is hypertrophied and the type of patient uh, there is compulsive type of attitude with more fisting then we should really give metacarpophalangeal block to the orthosis again sustained finger tip load has been shown to increase carpal tunnel pressure uh, the thumb position does not alter the carpal tunnel position but sustained position of thumb with sustained Sustained ulnar deviation has been shown to increase the carpal pressure by 
50 times. So we should really avoid any uh, like glass holding. Even if you are holding the glass, we are in a position of uh, thumb, uh, ulna deviation. So we should avoid such activities. Loading FPL has not shown to be any changes in a carpal canal pressure. Effect of forearm position. Full supination has been shown to increase the pressure, increase the symptoms, but uh, pronation to 45 degrees has been shown to relieve the symptoms. That's why uh, if, even when a typing job, if the, the, whenever you are explaining the patient for manager, changing your work job, you should advise patient to keep their hand in 45 degrees of pronation rather than keeping it full pronation because again the pronator teres muscle gets relieved is relaxed at a uh, in the pronated stage so that is not giving the compression at the proximally uh, again effect of externally pressure so whenever you are wrapping the you know uh, the the straps of the orthosis should not apply pressure on the volar aspect of wrist. It's, if it is, you can just shift the pressure proximally or little distally and not exactly over the wrist. And again, sustained posture, repetitive activity, you have to avoid that, the, at least during the early stage and acute onset. Because sustained compression on the nerve is going to cause degeneration and axonal myelination. So you really need to be considerate enough that work is not adding on to the stress. So here we can see various orthosis fabrications that are made and all have made, all have kept the wrist into the neutral position. Here the MCP is being, MCP uh, joint is not covered under the orthosis and left free because they have found out that uh, it's not required uh, to the it was not it might not be required for the patient here they have covered up the mcp into extension so it just allow patient to do hook fisting here they have also covered the thumb in the patients who are having carpal tunnel syndrome along with the thumb uh, thumb signs like a cmc joint osteoarthritis where you want the thumb to be into relaxed position um, here they have relieved the fbl like interphalangeal joint of the thumb so as the FPL tendon loading has not been significant for changing the canal pressure, so they have we can relieve it. But again, it depends upon the patient if the symptoms are associated with the uh, uh, CMC arthritis or decurvent stenosynovitis, then we can actually consider giving the orthosis uh, along with the thumb uh, into immobilized position. Coming on to the post-operative management, the goals of carpetanal release are as follows. The, it decompresses the nerve, it improves the excursion of the nerve, and it prevents the progression of nerve damage. So majority, there are two types of surgery. First is the open release and second is the endoscopy. Both have been shown to be equally effective in relieving the carpal canal pressure, but the complications associated with the endoscopic are more than with uh, this thing. So we will see further what are the problem areas associated with post-operative management. As we see, uh, we know that uh, once the surgery is done, the canal pressure is relieved. The nerve is relieved from the pressure and the symptoms immediately re recovers. So patient re really feels very better, but there is a scar tenderness. There is a pillar pain. So pillar pain is something which is there along the mid hypothenar and thenar eminence. So it is not similar to the scarping. It is similar to the, uh, it is it is along the end of the flexor and oculum cut, which gives the pain. Uh, the pain usually resolves within six months. So there is 25% of pain resolves within three months and the remaining 90% pain resolves within uh, six months. But uh, some patients still uh, remain with, with pain. So in that cases, the laser therapy has been shown to be very effective to reduce pillar pain. Uh, the, the problem that lies with surgery can be adherence of medial nerve or inter, intraneural scarring, uh, incomplete tendon line. The other very rare problems are bow stringing of the ligament, the palmaris longus, uh, uh, inflammation along the palmaris longus tendon, the tendon gets adhered. And uh, some patient might develop uh, stiffness along the wrist and some might land up into CRPS. These are really very few cases documented, but there are cases who have gone into such complications post-surgical. 
So management includes, so early mobilization following is advised as there is no uh, harm in, uh, in mobilizing early. So, but uh, the orthosis positioning for 25 degrees of extension is advised as to reduce tension along the scar of the volar, scar that is placed volarly. Gentle composite fish for first few days uh, is advised because you want a uh, circulation, you want uh, to reduce the edema. But again, strengthening you need to go, you need to progress with strengthening really gradually. Progression to differential tendon glidings and a gentle nerve gliding exercise can be started at POD4. If the symptoms are still persisting, then you should really consider starting with a nerve gliding exercise. Scar massage once the scar is healed completely. Uh, then gradual strengthening. So in, at, uh, the author has advised to go ahead with the intrinsic strengthening first and isometric type of strengthening and going gradual with it. Posture correction remains the mainstream and return to work. So the communication with the super work supervisor regarding minimizing the stress and repetitive motion, ergonomic chairs and avoiding vibratory tools and use of padded work gloves, gloves is advised because you don't want the symptoms to persist and recur even after the surgery. Aerobics treatment for weight loss and uh, instruction to patient to decrease the post-operative problem associated with over exercise, under exercise, overuse, and wound problem. So all these things needs to be explained to the patient that you need to balance both exercise and rest judiciously after the surgery, and you should go progressive. You should gradually return to your activities once the uh, swelling and uh, inflammation has reduced. These are my references, and I would like to conclude my talk. Thank you. So thank you so much, Bhakti, for a very, very informative talk. In fact, the talk has been so complete. I was planning to ask you a couple of questions at the end of the talk, but it has been so complete with information that there are no questions. Thank so you. I mean, I'm very proud that our alumni has been really trained very well. In fact, even talking about each of the modality along with the specifications of the current to be used, uh, for how much time it should be used, how many sessions are advisable, and all were evidence-based. Uh, be it extracorporeal shockwave therapy or laser, all ultrasound. I mean, you were so specific with all the specifications which are going to be needed that anyone who's listening to this, I think, will get a complete overview about what can be, you know, from the electrotherapy as well as from the kinesio, I mean, the exercise therapy, what all should be done for even going about with the evidence for yoga, the evidence for orthosis, you know. And a uh, very interesting concept of the lumbricals coming into the canal. So, you know, uh, sustained grip uh, with ulna deviation creating issues. So all these were very clinical gems that you had shared during your talk. And I'm very, very thankful that uh, you have taken this. I think uh, it has been well worth the wait. So I guess uh, Dr. Varith uh, spoke about the surgical aspect and he also gave a lot of clinical pearls in his talk. And Dr. Bhakti just kind of completed the entire thing by giving the entire perspective of rehab. So from both your point of view, they have been so complete with the information. I guess we don't have any questions for them. So with that view in mind, thank you so much for this enlightening. And I'm sure I'm going to pers kind of pressurize all our postgraduate students also to see this. I hope they have seen it because I'm sure it will go a long way in improving their understanding about carpal tunnel syndrome and its rehabilitation. Thank you so much. So that's a big, big thank you to Dr. Bhakti Kandedia as well as Dr. Varit to have enlightened us about the entire management of carpal tunnel syndrome. I'm sure the viewers have kind of uh, been uh, educated and informed about a lot of evidence-based uh, management which is out there. And uh, hopefully the management of all patients with carpal tunnel is just going to be improved after listening to this talk. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for providing me opportunity, ma'am. <laughs>